911. And I'm so honored to have my friend back again, Sandy Botkin. He, he, we have had some great conversations. We did a few shows a few years ago and they keep cycling around because everybody gets so much value from Sandy. Sandy is a wealth of information on something that everybody needs to know about. Right, Sandy? Taxes. They do. <laughs> I'm glad to have you here, really. Thank it's you. It's a pleasure to be here. It really is. You know, you, 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 why don't you tell everybody a little bit about, because I gave a fabulous intro about you in the beginning, but okay. share, share a little bit more. Thank you. First of all, I want to tell you folks how honored I am to be here participating with Chris. You know, I understand many of you are in your own business, and I've always had a lot of respect for anyone who's willing to take maybe a little more risk in order to make a lot more money. Uh, so congratulations to you. And, 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 I, and there's another reason is that, you know, I'm self-employed. My parents were self-employed. So I've always liked helping out people, you know, like my parents as well as myself. So there's a lot of reasons why I like doing this. All right. First of all, let me give a little, give a little background about me. Uh, this picture I've been told is better looking than I am. Uh, well, I have lost some weight, so I'm actually doing pretty, pretty well these days. Uh, my name is Sandy Botkin. Uh, I'm a former IRS attorney and trainer of IRS attorneys nationwide. So if you think of an IRS agent as a rat, I guess that makes me the head rodent. <laughs> I've been lecturing for, I've been president of my lecturing organization for many years at the Tax Reduction Institute. I'm a best-selling author of several books. If one just actually uh, was updated, you can get a hold of it, which I highly recommend. It's called Lower Your Taxes Big Time 2023-2024 Edition. Don't let the year kid you. It's really 2022-2023. Okay. So it's very, very good. And I highly recommend this to all of you. And I'm also, I'm also the tax director of a company called Midas IQ, which is kind of like a whole video educational series. Uh, think of us as, as uh, like, like, like offering courses, except on tax reduction for self-employed individuals. And I've been a, a guest tax expert on Fox, CNN, CBS, and CNBC, and among many others. And I'm not saying this to impress you. I just want you to know that I know what I'm talking about. And there's a lot of things that I'm going to be covering. Some of you may wonder, is this true? Yeah, it is. And we're going to be talking about uh, fourth quarter planning. And, and frankly, a lot of people haven't really thought about the fourth quarter since they filed their tax return. And the question is, is it really too late to do anything to lower the amount of taxes that we pay? And a lot of people think it is too late. Well, that's a very common mistake and misunderstanding, by the way because there's a lot of deductions that are going to be too late to qualify for this year. I admit that, at least in a meaningful way. But many of you may be behind but you, and, and may not be able to take advantage of all the opportunities that are available to you. But, you know, I like to think of this as kind of like a football game. You know, Tom Brady, which is actually one of the more well-known quarterbacks for this, is one of the best fourth quarter comeback quarterbacks in history. There's been numerous games that he has been in where he pulled it out at the end of the fourth quarter. And the same thing is true in tax planning. Uh, in a sense, uh, I like to think of tax planning as a game. If you know the rules, you do a lot better. And, and the tax game is very similar to playing uh, chess or tic-tac-toe, okay? And it's basically a game of rules and a game of strategy. And the question is, do you know the rules? If you don't, what do you think is going to happen to you versus somebody who do knows the rules? Let's be honest. You know, on one side, you have the IRS, and their job is to collect revenue for the government. And they also have the benefit of being the enforcer of the laws and, of course, and the rules, and they know the rules. On the other side of the table, they have you, the business owner. And you usually have maybe a CPA if you're, if you're smart enough. But the problem is that I'm going to show you in a minute that your CPA is usually distracted because they have too much going on. So it's more like they're on, a, it's more like you're on a phone a friend option when things go wrong. And I'll, I'll prove that to you. Okay. Now, basically, as a business owner, you got three choices. One, to, most people don't realize that they're overpaying their taxes. And I'm not the only one who says this. Uh, I mean, Forbes have said this. Uh, in fact, we estimate that well over 95% of anyone we talk to overpays their taxes for a host of reasons, some of which I'll get into now. So as I said, you have two choices. You can continue to overpay your taxes and basically donate to the IRS every year, except you don't even get a deduction for that. I can assure you they don't need the money. They really don't. The second thing is you can hire a CPA that does tax planning 
for you in particular. Now, this, by the way, is an expensive service. These CPAs charge 500 bucks an hour. So it may cost you 5,000 on the low end and actually uh, probably more like 50,000 plus for bigger businesses. But I can tell you it's 100% worth it. There's, you know, uh, John Maynard Keynes, the former Nobel Prize winner in economics, said that the best thing you can do from an economic perspective is to get your taxes down to the legal minimum. And he was true then when he said it, it's true now. And the third thing is that if you want to save money and you want to get the same benefits as the tax planning, instead of spending fifty to $500,000 or $50,000 on an accountant, you can get educated like you're doing today. And you, if you know enough, you get to know enough about the rules and the strategies to allow you to work with your existing CPA and then have a meaningful conversation with them in order to implement the strategies. Does that make sense, everybody? And this is by far the least expensive way, I'll tell you that right now, to do this. And if you want my help after hearing these tips today, I'm going to show you how I routinely help people like you save an average of $20,000 a year. I'm not exaggerating, by the way, within a year at a reasonable price. Okay. Does that sound fair? And one of the ways, obviously, is to get my book, Lower Your Taxes, Big Time. But, you know, a lot of people don't want to read an entire book and, and there's more to it. What do you do if you have questions? How do you implement the individual things? And that's why I'm going to show you what to do. Now, Chris will ask you, uh, first of all, a couple of things. There's a few easy tips that uh, I, I want to save you money on your taxes. And, and let me just go through just a few of the things that are available to you. First, let's cover one of the simplest ways that there are, uh, especially in my coming to holiday season towards the end of the year, that you could take advantage of. And so I, I really wanted to start getting on this. Uh, and this tip, by the way, involves business gifts to organizations, but not to individuals. I'll explain why. Now, this sounds kind of silly, making a gift to an organization instead of the person I deal with. But here's the deal. As a business owner, you're only allowed to deduct under current tax law $25 in gifts, business gifts, per person, per year. So if I want to give Chris a nice year-end gift for having me on and doing business with me, and I give her a big candy basket worth $400, all I can write off is, is $25 if I make the gift out to her. And a married couple, by the way, counts as one person. So I make it out to her and her, her, her spouse. Too bad. It's still $25. Okay. So let, I'll take another example. Let's say you wanted to give a gift to one of your best clients named Steve. If you bought Steve a $100 gift, you can only write off $25 of that. Okay. Everybody understand that? But there's a little bit of a loophole in the tax law that I think uh, you need to know about that will make gifts to organizations which do not have any limit at all. How would you like to get around that $25 limit altogether and get 100% deduction? Doesn't 100% sound better than $25 limit? Sounds better to me. So let's take uh, Chris as an example. Assume that uh, Chris heads up her company, which she does, or you can use your friend Steve. Maybe that's a better example. Uh, and he, Steve uh, heads up at the purchasing department of a company. Now, if you send Steve that same $100 gift that I talked about, but you address it to the purchasing department of, say, XYZ company, okay, and you keep uh, a picture to show that how it was addressed, maybe you take a picture with your iPhone, then you can write off the entire $100 because you're not making the gift out to Steve. You're making the gift addressed out to the purchasing department of XYZ company. It sounds the same, but it's different, even though he's the head of the, of the, of the purchasing department. Okay. By doing that, it's, you get 100% write-off. Pretty great. So unless you're giving away inexpensive gifts to clients or prospects, you want to give them to a company or to a group instead of a specific individual. And that was on a, a little $100 example, because addressing it to a business makes the deduction unlimited. So you, I think you can see how this would allow you to save a lot more money that would otherwise be taxed. Everybody understand that? Okay. Let's talk about another tip, and I'm going to move fairly quickly. I, I, you know, I can, I'm an ex-New Yorker. I can talk at 60 miles an hour with a 120-mile-an-hour breeze. But the good news is this is being recorded, and you will get a copy of the recording. Okay, So I, I want you all to know this. All right. So let's talk about another tip, because I, I don't like to waste time. I don't want to waste your time, and I don't want my time wasted. That's why I want to go as quickly as I can.
And this is a strategy that has been used by the rich for many years. And Chris knows about this. She's, she's done it herself in many ways. And this is called income shifting. Now, this sounds kind of like a fancy term, but really all it does is it shifts some of your income to next year, or maybe some of your, and there's two types of income shifting. One is income shifting to next year where you get a postponement of when you have to pay the tax. And one is where you shift it to lower bracketed individuals, like your children, grandchildren, things like that. There's really two types. Let's talk about the one that we shift to next year. This is a fun one too. Depending on what you think is going to happen to the, in the tax law, you may do the reverse of what I'm about to show you. So you got to kind of make a, a choice as to whether your taxes are going to be higher this year or next year. You're going to make more money next next year, which means you'll pay more taxes, or you're going to make more money this year. So you may have to make that decision. And working with a good accountant or working with Chris is something you might want to consider. Okay, but if you're trying to lower your taxes this year, we'll make that assumption. Okay, then there are a few strategies to employ. Uh, one strategy is you can postpone billing clients until the first of the year to push that income to next year. So instead, like let's say you bill them right now in December, you're taxed on whatever you they send you. But if you bill them in January, you don't have to pay tax on that money until April 15th of the following year. You get a whole year deferral. What's that worth? Okay. So you postpone it for a year. Or another thing you can do is you can approach vendors, people you owe money to, maybe marketing people, Facebook marketing, whatever you do, people you owe money to, and prepay those expenses for things that will happen next year. So you actually prepay it this year. As long as you're operating on a cash basis, you should be able to push the income around and get an immediate deduction for your expenses. Now, if you're worried about taxes going up next year and you'll think you'll make more money next year, then you want to do the exact opposite of what I'm going to try to say, which means you try to bill your clients this year while prepaying your expenses next year, postponing prepayment of your pay expenses till next year. So a lot of it depends on what you expect to have. So that's tip number two defer taxes for a year or prepay it and get it this year. And by the way, an interesting fact, you get a deduction when, if you use a credit card, when you charge the item. So if you charge it in December, whether it be a charitable contribution or whether it be a business expense, even though you don't make the payment to next year, you get the deduction this year, not to mention you get all those points. So that's something you may want to deal with your credit card. So keep that in mind. All right, tip three, let me move on. I don't want to we have a lot of things to cover in a limited time. Many people in this country like to give to charities out of the goodness of their heart. And I like to give every year, that's for sure. And, and if you've been blessed, I certainly believe that you should uh, you know, give back to a cause that you care about. And there's a lot of causes I care about, from animals to heart association to cancer to a whole bunch of things. And I believe you should give back to the cause that it's most important to you. And it's an amazing thing to see. And I truly believe that it's one of the greatest things uh, about our country. We were, we're a very charitable country in many ways. An added bonus and incentive though for giving charitably was that you have the ability to itemize your deductions on your tax return and get a deduction for it. But the problem is now that the standard deduction threshold has been increased, and actually it's been doubled, you don't, you don't get to itemize unless you exceed your standard deduction. So many people won't qualify because their total itemized deductions may not exceed the standard deduction. For example, standard deduction for a couple is now about $25,000. Standard deduction for an individual is about $12,500. But under some new tax law, if even if you don't itemize, you can still deduct $300 for an individual and $600 for married filing jointly if you make cash donations. It's a special deduction, even though you, you don't itemize. So please be aware of that. You, if you make a cash donation, you can get a $300 deduction from gross income if you're an individual and $600 if you are married. Now, Many people, including myself, will want to itemize because, frankly, I usually give away a lot more than 300 or 600 as a, as a married filing uh, jointly. So what do you do? If you itemize, you get more deductions. But the problem is your standard deduction threshold has been increased. It's almost 13000 if you're single and it's 25900 if you're married. Okay? So, which means that it's a lot more difficult to qualify for itemized deductions. And that means that if you don't reach that higher threshold, which means your, your, charitable, your itemized deductions don't exceed your, um, 
your chart, your, uh, I'm sorry, your standard deduction, your itemized deductions don't exceed your standard deduction. That's what I meant to say. Okay. So your itemized deductions don't exceed 25,900 if you're married or 12,950 if you're single, then you don't get it. You don't, you're not able to itemize. You don't reach the higher thresholds. Okay. And by the way, itemized deductions, just so you know what I'm talking about, they include all mortgage interest, property taxes up to $10,000 and charity. That includes charity. There's no limit on charity, by the way. So I'm going to teach you how you can beat the standard deduction system. And so again, you know the rules, you can beat the game. It's like the game tic-tac-toe. The person who taught you the game probably beat you all the time. But once you know the rules, you know, it turns out to be a tie, right? So I'm going to teach you how to get around these, this, this st high standard deduction and get over that so you can start itemizing. So one thing that many donors are planning on doing, this is something that'll take a little bit of thought process on your part, is to take the deduction that you would normally make. So I'm not asking you to make things you would not normally do. You normally make over a two or even three year period, but donate it all at once this year. So instead of making a, a church or synagogue or mosque contribution this year, next year, the year after, do it all this year. Okay. If that amount allows you to reach a new threshold, it may be worth it because you're basically doubling or tripling the amount you would normally contribute. And then next year, you would simply hold off on your deduction if you can do that and take the standard deduction. Then you, re you repeat the doubling strategy the following year. If you want to triple it, you can do this and then take don't take a charitable contribution for two years and so on. So you do it every three years. Okay. So this is how you do that. You just repeat and rinse. You just keep doing it every, every two or three years. So you're really donating every other year or every third year in this case, either way. And you're getting around the charitable contribution limit. Uh, and, you, and, and you also are ch being charitable. Okay. And this is about, I got to tell you something. Uh, this is one of the biggest expenses that most people and families have that I want to get to. And this is medical hey, expenses. Sandy? Yeah, Chris. Yeah. Um, when it says Chris will ask, we want to be more like a Q and A. So you okay. just finish up that one and then let her ask the question and then okay. get to the next slide. I'll just stop. Go ahead, Chris. Okay. One of the biggest expenses most people and families have are medical expenses. And I know you have a great tip for this, right? Can you explain it to us? Excellent. Glad you raised that, Chris. Now, uh, I, you know, one of the best ways that have been in the tax code, by the way, you're going to be surprised since 1955 that unfortunately most self-employed people are not doing is something called a health reimbursement arrangement, otherwise known as HRA, health reimbursement Ar arrangement. And believe me when I tell you, this can save you a ton of money. Now, the way this works is that the government allows a company to set up a special benefit plan for employees. One of these options is to set up a benefit plan that reimburses all employees and members of their family for their out-of-pocket medical and dental expenses. Now, you don't hear much about this because most large businesses uh, basically would not want to take on the risk of reimbursing employees for all of their medical and dental expenses. That would be a huge expense a business can't afford. And frankly, they couldn't afford it if they wanted to. But the situation totally changes if you're self-employed and you or your spouse are the employee. So let's run an example, okay? Let's, this is an example of someone I know named Mary. Mary has 10,000 of out-of-pocket medical expenses this year. Now, things like her deductibles count towards the total and coinsurance and counts and dental counts and all these other things. Now, normally, she doesn't get to deduct that cost. Why? All she can write off is her insurance because there is a high threshold on medical expenses. The threshold is 7.5% of her adjusted gross earnings. So if she's making $100,000 a year, 7,500 of that goes out on, is on the threshold. So she would only get the benefit of 2,500 of this $10,000 out-of-pocket expenses. But watch this. What do the savvy business owners do? Now, watch this one. This is a, it's almost like a magic trick. It's a shake of the hand here. If Mary had an, a health reimbursement arrangement, an HRA in place, she could essentially pay for this $10,000 and then bill onto her business for the reimbursement. Essentially, the business 
would get a $10,000 deduction for federal, state, and social security taxes, fully deductible, with no threshold. You got around the threshold. I want you to realize this. And what's good about this is that by hiring your spouse, your spouse can then elect family coverage. Now, who are the members of the family? You. And if you have any dependent children under age 26, you can cover them too. I mean, what a great deal. Your business gets a deduction and you get you and your family get that money tax free. Everybody wins except the government. It's a win win. Yeah, that's great. I mean, it is great. I did this for myself where I said I hired my spouse. She elected family coverage and I covered um, orthodonture. I was able to reimburse twelve thousand dollars of braces, folks. OK. Now, when looking to do an HRA. A couple of things I want to emphasize here. I mean, it's really a fabulous thing. And by the way, I know I'm moving fairly quickly, folks. That's why this is taped. If you want more information, some of it's in my book, Lower Your Taxes Big Time, and also available in the Midas IQ, which I'll get into uh, in a little bit. And we'll have, we'll have links uh, attached to the show later, too. That's right. You'll have all these links, so you'll, you'll have all this information. Right. But uh, one of the things I want to mention with the HRA is you really need a good fiduciary, an administrator, basically, that can handle the IRS compliance, the accounting, and to manage the account. For example, they you want to have them provide you with a debit card, for example. It's not expensive to get an administrator, but they and, and they give you a, a debit card, which I, which I find is very convenient to use directly with medical and dental expenses. Basically, what does the administrator do? They track all the documentation required by the IRS and produce the paperwork that you need at the end of the year. It's really nice to have one factor in your life that's simple and handled for you, isn't it? And that's what an administrator really does. You know, a lot of times I find that self-employed people try to do it themselves. And it's frankly very easy to mess up. And besides, you're better off focusing your time and energy on building your business. Don't you agree? Absolutely. So uh, to, to get a good administrator, we're not talking about a lot. We're talking, what, about $40 a month or something like that, I mean, which could save you literally tens of thousands of dollars. I mean, this is probably the best return on investment you'll ever get. To find out, we've done some research about administrators that handle this. There's also a question answer period where you can, uh, you can find out whether you're eligible for the HRA. But to do this, I want you to go. You'll see a link here. It's hra.midasiq.com. That's hra.midasiq.com. If the link doesn't work, just type in your browser. Go to hra.midasiq.com. Trust me, it'll save you a fortune. Okay, Sandy. Sometimes sure. when, when you own your own business and you have some years that the income is slim and others are when you have more income on those extra lucrative years, is there any way to lower your taxes? Well, that's an excellent point. I have actually two tips that will help in this situation. I'm glad you asked that, actually, Chris. Uh, the first one, uh, which I will get to, is tip number five. This is, could be a lot of fun, actually. Depending on your cash situation, though, and that is... Uh, you're going you're gonna to like when I say this, go on a shopping spree. Does that sound fun or what? Right. But, but, but this is a special type of spot shopping spree. We're not, we're not buying things like, like um, clothing and knickknacks and things we don't want or need. This is a shopping spree for business equipment or business tools that you use in business. Now, maybe it's a new computer. Maybe it's a new iPhone, maybe it's a new iPad, or maybe if you are in a construction, uh, some tower tools, if you do a lot of construction in your business. You know, normally when you buy equipment for your business, it could be a, a couch, it could be furniture, you get to write off the cost of the equipment over time. So for example, if you bought a computer, you'd normally write it off over five years. So a 2000 Mac MacBook Pro would be written off over $400 a year for five years. But, okay. The smart business people don't do things like that. What do they do? There is a section of the Internal Revenue Code that allows you to deduct the full cost of the equipment in the year you purchase it. Now, let me think about this for a moment. We're in December, folks. You can do it now this year in December and get the deduction for the whole year, even if it's in December 20th, December 25th, December 27th, okay? So you get a full deduction for it. As as the, based on the business use, as long as you're purchasing less than, as there is a catch, less than one point oh one million eighty thousand. As long as it's less than one million eighty thousand, you get a full deduction for it. Okay, 
And that's assuming all your purchases for the year are less than 1,080,000. And if you happen to be uh, on this call and in business that is buying more than that, then there's a way to get around that too. As you know, there's an old saying in Washington, D.C., where there's a will, there's a lawyer. Okay. So there's a way to get around that. So if you buy more than a million eighty, if you end up buy, buying two million or three million, four million, I, there's a way to get around that with something called bonus depreciation that you need to look into. And that's good for this year. That is slowly being reduced. So it's especially good for this year. But keep that in mind if you end up buying a lot of equipment. Okay. Now, there is a caveat here in that the equipment has to be used in your business. Buying a computer and not using it for business, simply to play games on it, is not going to be a write-off, okay? It's got to be used in your business. But as I said, this could be pretty fun, okay? Now, that was the first way, and that was to buy equipment in your business and tools, the sec- or furniture, for that matter. The second way, and by the way, I get a lot more into this in other ways, in seminars, individual things. I'm, 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 many times I'm giving you enough information and I have eight seminars on, okay? This is just an overview of some of the stuff that's available to you. But here's tip number six, which is the second way of um, writing off your taxes, especially uh, getting re- equipment. And that is uh, one of the more well-known year-end deductions. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever noticed that a lot of business owners start driving new vehicles towards the end of the year. You know, a lot of times I'm, I'm driving on the highway and all of a sudden I'm seeing all these new cars around me. And it always seems to happen around December. You ever notice that? If you haven't, I got to tell you, try paying a little closer attention. And I think you'll soon notice a pattern. Okay. There's a couple of reasons for that. One of which you get special deals at the end of the year, a deal at discounts because they want, they want to move the stuff out so they can make room for the new cars. But savvy business owners take stock of this situation at the end of the year in order to determine if buying a vehicle will save them tens of thousands of dollars in taxes. I'm not exaggerating about that, by the way. If you could, let me ask you, if you could buy a new vehicle with that, with that money instead of paying that same amount of money to the government in the form of taxes, would that be interesting to you? You yeah. could either give it to the government or buy a new vehicle. Which would you prefer? Okay. Well, I've got some news for you. It's possible. And this is done every year by hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of business owners. And let me show you how this works. All right. Again, I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview. If you're willing to buy a qualified truck, SUV, or van for business, then you can write off up to 100% of the purchase price this year. Why? Because the IRS looks at these as work vehicles and they allow special rules for them that a typical car doesn't get, which allows you to deduct these things quicker. A regular sedan, for example, will not qualify for this type of treatment. But anything that doesn't qualify for this rule must be written off over five years. So it's not that bad, but like if you bought a um, a Mercedes, for example, you might a smaller Mercedes, you might be able to write it off over five years. But if you buy a qualified truck, SUV, or van, you could write up the business use of it in one year, this year. I mean, you get a, a deduction for 50000 bucks or 60000 bucks. I mean, heck, talk, talk, talk about t- take a bite out of taxes. That'll really take a bite out of your taxes. Okay? So let's. what do I mean by a qualified SUV or truck? Let's, let's get into what that means. First of all, let's talk about trucks. If you want to buy a truck under this rule, a qualified truck, then your vehicle has to meet certain rules. First of all, the truck has to be new to you. Doesn't have to be new, just new to you. Okay. You can buy a used truck, for example, as long as it's new to you. And the same thing is true with SUVs, as long as it's new to you. Now, Second rule, it has to have a gross vehicle weight, which means carrying weight of over 6,000 pounds. Now, you can go Google gross vehicle weight of your vehicle, or a better way is, as I didn't even know this until about a year ago, when you get out of your car or truck or or SUV, open up the door, and in the door jam is a metal plate showing gross and net vehicle weight. Just check out the gross vehicle weight. It'll say GVWR, gross Uh, vehicle weight rating, GVWR, okay? You want to make sure it says at least 6,000 pounds, more than 6,000, actually, 6,001. Now, it also, by the way, just a little rule of thumb, uh, the the new BMW SUV has a gross vehicle weight of 6,002 pounds. You think that's coincidental? (laughs) Third rule, it must be at least a six 
foot cargo area. So the cargo area has to be at least six feet. A good the F-120, the F-150s, the F-250s, all of that meet those rules, by the way. The Ford F-150s. Uh, and most trucks do, by the way. And finally, no rear seating. Now, you could have rear seating, but then you come under the SUV rules, all right? But if you want to ride it off as a truck, no rear seating. And if you meet these criteria, guess what? You just qualified. It's that simple, okay? And here's the interesting thing. You don't have to pay cash. If you want to finance the vehicle, you still get a deduction this year, even though you don't pay it off for the next three or four years. Hey, do we have good taxes, good tax system or what? Okay? All right. Now, I know a lot of you like rear seating in a truck. I don't, but you do. And I have good news for you. You can still ride off the vehicle, the truck, even if it has real rear seating. But the catch is that it's classified as not as a truck, but as an SUV, a sports utility vehicle. The sports utility vehicle rules also offers fantastic deductions. In fact, it's, I would say, is almost as good as the truck. But it's scheduled to decrease after this year. So be alert that it's ideal for this year. And it won't be as profitable as it is now. So if you want an SUV, I certainly suggest that you get it this year. Okay? And you get 100% right off of the business use. So what are the requirements for uh, a new van or SUV? The van or SUV are the same rules. Well, first of all, you need a gross vehicle weight. Remember I said that G V WR gross vehicle weight rating of uh, at least 6,000 pounds. So that's the first rule. Second rule, it has to be built on a truck chassis, just like trucks. That's the second rule. And thirdly, it needs to carry passengers. See, with trucks, it shouldn't have passengers. With SUVs, it actually has to have rear seating, has to carry passengers. Pretty straightforward. And if you meet the rules, you get to write off 100% of the business use. So let me give you an example. Let's say I buy a Cadillac Escalade. Every accountant I know is buying a Cadillac Escalade, which I know meets the rules. And you pay $60,000 for it, use 80% for business, you can write off 80% of the sixty dollars or $48,000. It's that simple. Okay? Now, a word of caution. Don't expect the car dealership to know what is deductible. They don't know. They just don't. And your average car salesman isn't going to know either. OK, these guys, in my, uh, in my experience, have absolutely no idea what qu qualifies for this. So you want to make sure that you did your research or you call your accountant before you sign on the dotted line. So I just want to make that very clear. Now, if you buy a qualified truck, then you can write off 100 percent of it based on the rules that I gave you. Uh, as I said, if let's say you pay 50 percent of the truck, uh, you pay fifty thousand dollars for the truck, use eight percent for business. You can write off 80 percent of the 50 or forty thousand dollars even and, and you and you bypass all the luxury limits, even if uh, you, you paid cash or you finance it. It doesn't really matter. And if you want to really take advantage of this truck and or SUV strategy, then you could buy the truck or SUV as late as December 31st. Drive it 100% for business that year. And now you write off 100% of the cost of the vehicle. Now, it's important to remember that... Um, you must have possession of the truck or SUV. So if you buy it, then you don't take possession of it, then that's a problem. So it's got to, you've got to be able to take possession of it, which is uh, the way things are now. Often a waiting period to receive your vehicles can take a while. Okay? So plan accordingly. I just want to make that point well known. You know, boy, you are such a wealth of information. <laughs> really. Well, thank you. And, yes. You know, there's so much going on right now with the, government adding and changing tax credits and the new green initiatives out there and all the different credits and created for the COVID pandemic. Where do we go for accurate information and to know what to qualify for? Because you hear all these different things, but it's just spins around, right? All right. That's, you're absolutely right. It's a very important point. And there are a number of, uh, first of all, let me get into tip number eight. There are many tips out there that get overlooked all the time, and I'm going to go over a few of them that can save you a lot of money that deal with tax credits. Now, credits are really interesting little gizmos here. They are better than a deduction because a credit is a dollar for dollar reduction in your taxes. So we love credits. Believe me, Chris and I love these things. Okay. Now, there's a couple credits that I think you want to you want to pay attention to. I'm going to cover 
two on the slide, and I'm going to add one. You don't care if I add something here, do you, folks? Uh, I'm going to add one that came in under the oh, incentive. No, no. yeah. I'm going to add. I'm going to actually add two that came yeah. in under the Incentive um, Assistance Act. So I want to give you the latest information that was just passed like a month or two ago. So uh, you'll get the information. Now, the first credit I want to mention is the Employee Retention Tax Credit. Some of you may have heard about this. Uh, this is not going to be around forever. So it's something you really not take advantage of here. And then you have to go quickly. In fact, they were built as a sort of reward for retaining employees during COVID. And if you have a legitimate or a couple legitimate employees uh, in your business, other than your immediate family, by the way, you could get up to a $26,000 per employee credit back from the IRS. So that's the first credit. Uh, the employees must be W-2s, not 1099s. Uh, this is basically good for only 2020 and 2021 during those peak COVID years. Uh, you can always file amended tax returns to get this to get a check now. So be aware of that. Okay. Uh, if you qualify, you haven't done this. Uh, I got to tell you, you're missing out because this is a once in a lifetime stimulus deal. And I don't have all the time to get into the details here. I do seminars on this and I, I do have to, in the seminar, I can do it. Uh, but basically, you have to have had a downturn in the second half of 2020 or in the first three quarters of 2021 to qualify. Or you are forced to shut down for periods of time during the co those COVID years. So if you meet any of those rules, you could have some unclaimed stimulus money that's waiting for you. Okay. The credit, uh, another credit that's largely going unclaimed is actually a payroll tax credit. And uh, let me, this is basically, uh, essentially, you're, basically your tax person really runs payroll, all right? It's not their warehouse, usually an accountant or some other firm that does the, the payroll. Also, large payroll processing companies aren't set up to file for this credit either. So either way, you're probably missing this. So you're likely to find a specialist to do this for you. And it sounds like this might be an, uh, to know about the payroll tax credit or the retention tax credit. Uh, please go to someplace, uh, a, a link that we can, we have some experts on this. It's MidasIQ.com forward slash ERC, which for employee retention credit. It's MidasIQ.com. You can click on it or you can just type it into your browser it's forward slash ERC. And we can have somebody work on that for your employee retention credit. So please be aware of that. Okay. Now, in addition to the employee retention credit, there is also a new R&D, research and development credit. And this one's really incredible. You can get a huge tax credit for investing in or creating new technology or even a process to make a new product or even improve an existing product. Okay. And this is how big tech companies pay almost zero taxes. You ever wonder why, why these big tech companies pay very little? Usually it's this credit. Okay. And basically the government decided to reward risk-taking. So for example, if you're investing in creating some new custom software like I did, or to run a business better, you can get this federal credit. Now, the R&D credit is also known as the Research and Experimentation Tax Credit. That's what it's known as. It's a federal credit that provides companies dollar for dollar cash savings for performing activities related to development, design, improvement of a product, process, formula, or software. So almost any kind of development of product or software can qualify here. The credit is, a, is a much needed cash to, will pr to provide and hire additional employees to expand your R&D, expand facilities, and much more. The credit was enacted in 1981 to stimulate innovation and encourage investments in development. And since then, by the way, a lot of states have passed their own version of the R&D credits. So you can get both a federal and a state credit. And as such, this benefit is available across a wide variety of industries. And again, to find out more about it, go to www.midasiq.com forward slash ERC. I mean, there's no reason not to do that. It doesn't cost you anything to, to do this, to find out about it. So definitely do it. Now, there's two more credits I want to mention that's not on the slide and that I want to mention because it came in under the Incentive Retention Act. I think it's called, it's actually not the incentive. It's called the, the um, I'm sorry, the Inflation Reduction 
Act. That's what it was called, the Inflation Reduction Act. And the Inflation Reduction Act had a, a number of things that benefited a lot of small businesses. A lot of people don't realize there were real lot of good things. But two of them that stand out. The first thing that stand out is um, electric vehicles. Normally this year, if you buy an electric vehicle, whether it's a Toyota, whether it's a Tesla, whether it's a, uh, a Leaf, whatever, whatever, you can get up to $7,500 tax credit, dollar for dollar reduction in, in vehicle, in buying this vehicle. Uh, the problem with that, though, which, which kills a lot of the benefit of it, is that it's limited to 200,000 models where you can get the credit. So by this time of year, almost every one of those models has eaten up their credit. And that's the problem with it. However, starting next year, the Inflation Reduction Act changed the rules for credits for solar panels. Plus, they were split, they were for, so, for solar cars uh, or for solar cars, for electric cars. Plus, they were supposed to phase out uh, a lot of some of these credits. So what they did was through 2033, so you got, first of all, you got a 10-year deferral. That's the first thing. Secondly, if you buy a solar car, so not a solar car, an electric car, I keep wanting to say solar, an electric car next year, you can get up to $7,500 tax credit with no model limit. That $200,000 limit per model is gone if you buy it next year. So that's the key. You want to buy your Tesla or your Leaf or your Toyota or your uh, Cadillac. Cadillac has a new IROC model and a bunch of others that have come out with these things. Now, there's a couple. There is a catch. Congress can't do anything simple. They, they just, I don't know why, they just can't do it, make it simple. There are two catches. Catch number one, is that when you buy this electric car, in order to get that up to $7,500 credit, 50%, uh, well, actually it's 40%, 40% of the things that make up the battery, 40% of the extracted minerals have to be done in the United States. So at least 40% of the extractions for the batteries have to be done in the U.S. Next year, I think in 2024, it'll be 50%. That number's going up. But it's 40% in 2023. So you want to make sure at least 40% of the battery is uh, the materials are made or extracted or in the United States, and you get at least half the credit. The other half of the credit is that 100% of the uh, battery must be assembled in North America, United States, Canada, or Mexico. Okay? If you, if you have it assembled, but you don't have it extracted, the materials extracted, then you only get half the credit. If you have it extracted, but not assembled, you get only half the credit. If you don't have either one, you don't get anything. OK, so you got to make sure of that. You can find out more about that by uh, Googling your vehicle that you want to buy. You can ask the dealer whether it works. You know, you want to make sure that you meet this credit. All right. Be, be aware of that. I believe Tesla's work. I believe the Cadillac Iraq works and a couple others work. But you want to make sure about the assembly as well as the extraction of the minerals for the battery. So be aware of that. That deals with electric cars. The second thing that changed is that solar panels used to get a tax credit, a 30% tax credit, which was reduced to 26% on solar panels that, that you put on your house. That was supposed to be eliminated by the end of this year. The new Inflation, Adjust, uh, Inflation Reduction Act extended solar panels through 2033, and they made it a full 30%. So you can get a 30% tax credit on solar panels, solar um, shingles, anything like that, geothermal, any of those things. And that's good for 10 years. So if you don't want to do it this year, you can do it next year. Okay? It doesn't matter if you finance it, if you buy it all this year and you pay credit card, you finance it over a year or two, and you still get the, the credit. It's a great credit. It's a whopping 30% credit. And a lot of, I didn't, I didn't realize this till recently, but a lot of states and a lot of utilities also give a credit. So if you're going to buy a solar panel, find out what your state does and what your state utility does, whether they will give you a credit as well. That could make the solar panels very affordable or certainly much more affordable. Let's put it that way. Okay. So that's the way uh, 
the credits work. All right, now we talked about a few of the credits, but there's a lot more credits that you can take advantage of. We, we talk, certainly talked about the solar, and we talked about the uh, electric cars, but we have biofuel credits, uh, qualified plug-in via electric vehicles I mentioned, renewable energy credits. Like if you buy uh, energy-saving windows, you can get a, a tax credit for these things. If you buy uh, energy-saving appliances, you can get a tax credit, uh, which is even better next year. Uh, there's pension plan startups. If it's a brand new pension plan, you can get up to a $500 tax credit. There, there are many more, any efficient home credits, and just many, many more. Okay. I just want to call that to your attention. All right. Wow. That you're going to just save us so much money here. This is, I mean, who gets excited about taxes unless you listen to Sandy Bucket? I mean, seriously, you take a very hard conversation. Just because you just shared with so many beautiful things. Do you have any final tips today that you want to share? Well, first of all, I like saving money in taxes. You know, every money every dollar you save in taxes is better than a raise, Chris, because it's after tax money. So it's kind of like a credit. So when you oh, save yeah. money in taxes, that's even better than a raise. But uh, let's, I do have a couple more tips. For okay. one tip, let me give you the last tip, actually. Or, oh, well, well, one of the last tips. And that's tip 10, use current market conditions to lock in any losses to offset your gains. So let me mention what I mean by this. Imagine you're reviewing your portfolio and you see that, that some of your tech holdings have done very well. They have risen sharply and some of your industrial stocks have dropped in value. And maybe you have another stock that has dropped in value. As a result, you have too much of your portfolio value exposed in the tech sector or in some other sector or maybe in, re in retail. So you want to realign your investments with your preferred allocation. So you might want to sell some of your tech stocks or your retail stocks and use some of these funds to rebalance. But in the process, you end up recognizing a significant taxable gain. You sell stock. If it has a gain, you'll pay, you have taxable gain. Ah, what do you do? This is where tax loss harvesting comes in. That's what it's called, tax loss harvesting. If you sell the industrial stocks that have declined in value, you could use those losses to offset the capital gains you got from selling your tech stocks, thereby reducing your tax liability because losses from one stock that you sell can be used against any gain from any other stock that you sell. Doesn't matter. Okay. Doesn't matter what sector, doesn't matter the industry, doesn't matter. In addition, if your losses are larger than your gains, you can use the remaining losses to offset up to $3,000 per year of ordinary taxable income. If you're married filing separately, it's $1,500, but generally it's $3,000 of ordinary income, such as your salary, for example. Any amount over $3,000, let's say you have a capital loss of $20,000, yeah, and you've already wiped out all your tax, your savings on, ta on sell of stocks. Well, you use $3,000 of the twenty. dollars the other $17,000 gets carried forward to the future to offset all future income and stock sales down the road. You never lose it. It just gets uh, carried over to the future, and it goes on forever. Okay? Okay, sign me up. <laughs> Right. Why do you know why do some business owners they you know they get they get educated about their taxes and what's the best way? What you know, what would you say, you know, for them how how to do that? Because there's right. a, this is a you know a, That's a, a very lot good of point. information, right? You know, why should the business owners know more about this? Obviously, there's a lot of reasons, but listen, yeah. it's important to be knowledgeable and it's just like this this game, this tax game, and take control of your own situation. If you know the rules, you can take control. If you don't know the rules, you can't. It's very simple. Remember what I said to you. Forbes recently estimate that the number of businesses that overpay their taxes to be as high as 90. 3%. I estimate more than that, actually. I, I think it's more, I think it's more like 95. That means that nine out of 10, more than nine out of 10 of you who are listening today, who are watching this webinar, overpaid your tax. I want that to sink in, by the way. All right. Even if you have a great accountant. Now, you might wonder, well, why doesn't my accountant pick up on these things? And I want to give you a dirty secret in the tax industry. Your overworked accountant, your overworked CPA probably has 300 other clients to serve at tax time. Now, so now that you know that, it probably wouldn't surprise you 
that we took an online survey of over 3,000 self-employed individuals, and we found that 80% of people who are unhappy, uh, people I, we interviewed, are unhappy with the experience that they've had with their accountant. 80%. They felt like they were leaving money on the table, and the, the, obviously the numbers show they are. And frankly, while that's totally unacceptable, it proves my point that the industry is broken. Now, so what's the key problem? The key problem, honestly, is not the accountant's fault. I know they may, maybe you think I'm making excuses, but tax filing is not the same as tax planning. Unless you are paying your CPA big bucks to spend dozens of hours working on your planning, then you are not getting the results that you could which is why I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, you have three choices. You could do nothing and continue to donate extra to the IRS. You can get a tax plan from a professional and pay anywhere between five and $50,000 or more per year, or you can let me help you do it yourself. And I wanna help you win the tax game. There are two types of business owners. There are those who overpay their taxes every single year without even knowing it. That's the worst part, they don't even know. And then there are those who use a playbook, just like a football playbook or a chess playbook, to legally slash their tax bill to as close to zero as possible. In this playbook, and by the way, which is written by myself and a lady named Dominique Molina, who's uh, very well, who's taking over as our tax compliance officer, you will discover in detail powerful strategies that will help you lower your taxes, you pay to the legal minimum. And today, because of your relationship with Chris, you can get both the ebook and an audio book. It's a version of our ebook for only $2. I'm not exaggerating. You get the ebook and the audio book. Just go to uh, MidasIQ.com forward slash playbook. It's MidasIQ.com forward slash playbook to snag this special deal. Again, you get both the ebook and the audio book for $2. That's MidasIQ.com forward slash playbook. Fabulous. That's, that's definitely really worth it. Now you, the books is just amazing. And I, and I have the older version of it that you gave me. It was fabulous. Um, but we've got a, a lot of good, you know, information on strategies. What it, what would people find in this? Can you kind of consolidate? Because sure. this is like almost like the Bible of taxes. Sure. <laughs> this is kind of like a reduced version of my book, Lower Your Taxes Big Time, but it's more explainable. Right. I mean, the more, my Lower Taxes Big Time is going to take some time to read that book, whereas this is, is much easier, much faster. Now, there are many topics that we cover, but I'm going to point out just a few of them that are in our ebook and are the book that you're going to be receiving. Uh, you get the magic blueprint trick that I've used to help many customers increase their home office deduction by 25%, more than they would have been able to take with no extra work. And I'll show you how to do the same thing. We'll show you how to get your accountant to focus on you, even though they have 300 other clients. How do you get them to focus on you? You're going to learn how to do that. Okay. You're learning the intentional tax advantage strategies that Congress has intentionally created for loopholes for business owners. You learn how to deduct the equivalent of your kids' hobbies and college and costs of wedding. I'm not exaggerating, okay? You learn why everyone needs to own a business in today's economy, even if it's only part time. All of these things and, and much, much more. You'll learn the nine factors, for example, that you should use to pick your, your entity. You ever wonder what kind of entity you should be? You're going to learn the nine factors and the critical steps necessary for setting up a home office to maximize the tax savings. And here's something. You'll learn the simple trick on how to write off all equipment that you use in your business twice. Notice, not once, twice. How's that? Rather than your measly one time that you're doing and much much more okay there's a lot more to this well we've got you know you've just given us such great information today uh, to help us lower taxes and i know everybody's a little nervous about that any final words that you want to leave with us sandy well, a couple of things. First of all, to get uh, this, this is all of us at the tip of the iceberg to get a hold of our of the book for two dollars. That's all it is. I'm not exaggerating. It's not two dollars plus shipping. Go to MidasIQ.com forward slash playbook. You can click on the link or you can just 
type it into your browser. Midas IQ, M-I-D-A-S-I-Q dot com forward slash playbook. Okay. Now, a couple other things I want to mention. You are overpaying your taxes. I hope I showed you that today. If you haven't been doing the things I've been saying, you've been overpaying your taxes. And that's and that's in the past as well. you got to learn how to play the tax game. You don't want to give the government your money if you don't have to. It's not good at managing it. There, I can promise you that the government isn't good at managing your money. And they won't give you anything back for it. They won't even send you a thank you if you overpay your taxes. Lowering your taxes to the legal limit is the best way to become wealthy. I can guarantee that. You know, when I worked as an accountant, I've seen people make the same amount of money living in the same type of house. One lives like a king. One can't figure out how to make their end meet. Why? One has gotten their taxes down to the legal minimum. One hasn't. You've got nothing to lose but fortunes to gain. It's that simple. And I want you to remember, sign up today and take advantage of this special deal with Chris to receive both the ebook and the audio book. It's not lower your taxes big time. That's that's an addition that you should have, but as a, it's like a reference. But the ebook and the audio book version of the simple playbook to lower your taxes to almost zero for just two dollars. I'm not exaggerating. Okay. I hopefully this will will make your it will lower your taxes and certainly make your life a lot less taxing. Okay, Chris, thanks for having me on, and I want to thank you all for joining us. Absolutely, Sandy, we really appreciate it, and we'll put uh, at notes and links and everything in the bottom. And go out there and get your tax lowered. Thank you, Sandy. There's so much to learn about healthy money. I hope today's discussion brings you one step closer to securing and protecting your future. So you can get started on the right foot, go to meetwithchrismeller.com and schedule your free financial fitness strategy session. Thank you for listening and please subscribe to Money 911 so you don't miss our next episode, which includes health, wealth, and peace of mind.